Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Answer his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Please remain standing for our first hymn. And that first hymn is number three. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Hymn number three.
I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles to the Scripture lesson for uh, this morning. If you're using the Pew Bible, you'll find it there on page 1207-1207 as we continue our journey through Second Peter. This morning we're going to look at verses 5 through 11. Brothers and sisters, give this careful attention for this is the very word of God. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So far, the reading of his word, would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, as your word has been read aloud in all of our hearing, we as your children come before your throne with praise for all that you are with worship for your majesty and glory, and asking that by the provision, through the work of your Holy Spirit that you have given to us, that we not only hear your word, that we're able to discern it, to understand it, and to gain wisdom from it. And for that purpose, Father, I ask that you would please bless my thoughts and words so that they would glorify you alone and that they would be food for your sheep. In Christ's name, amen. There's a uh, running discussion within the Christian faith. Uh, Some might even call it a debate, but I prefer discussion. And it's, it's kind of a broad topic. It revolves around the issue of who does what in the Christian faith. What parts does God do and what parts do we do? What is God's responsibility and and what's our responsibility? And it is a broad topic. But there's there's a couple of errors to avoid. And they're they're actually common errors. There's one poll that says God does everything. And we don't really need to do much of anything. We just need to let go and let God. And of course, there's variations of that I don't want to put everybody under the same carpet but they kind of go to the extreme where God just does everything and we just sit back and we kind of be more spectators now at the opposite pole is kind of a camp that says well God did his little part and the whole rest of it is up to us and neither of those are correct neither of those are correct let's be clear right up the front right off the bat When it comes to the saving work, our salvation, all that is necessary to be justified and counted righteous with God, Jesus, God has accomplished all of that in Jesus. And yet, he requires a response to that truth. He requires that we not just sit back and go, well, I've got my admission ticket, He requires that we respond to that truth according to his instructions about what our response ought to be, about what it means to be one of his children. Because God not only ordains the ends, the results, he also ordains the means, the circumstances that he will use in order to achieve those results 
and he includes his children in that process. We are part, all believers are part of the means by which God declares the gospel, brings it into the lives of those that he will call to faith, and models what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so because of that, here in this opening section of Peter's letter, he issues his first call to action. His first commands, and they are in the uh, uh, imperative mood if you're a grammar and syntax person. Do these things. Do these things. Make sure that you do these things. Make every effort to do these things. He's trying to let us know how important it is that we respond to that faith in an appropriate manner. He gives us instructions to do something that is really kind of almost uh, common sense. And yet it's amazing how much it gets passed over. He gives us instructions to grow. To grow, to develop. Now many of you uh, have had... Uh, uh, careers still some of you still have careers going on uh, some of you had some very long careers uh, my wife just marked 34 years at the school district that she works for now I don't think she's going to get mad because that is somewhat of an indication of her age but she started when she was 10 <laughs> see how I got out of that And as her husband, like anything, somebody shared with her life, it's amazing to see how she has grown and developed in her knowledge and expertise and ability in the different assignments that she's had throughout her career. And I'm using that analogy because it's one that we can all relate to and apply to almost every area of life. Why would we think that the Christian life is any different? Why would we think that following Jesus is any different. That when we first came to Christ, when we first heard his call and felt the work of the Spirit in us, we didn't immediately think, I raised my hand, I filled out the card, that's all there is to this. I hope we didn't. As one famous movie character said, you have just taken your first step, your first small step into a much bigger world. That's what he's calling us here, to grow. And this growth is a lifelong process. Before we get to that instruction, though, I want to point out the basis for his command to grow. Did you notice how verse 5 began? We're, we're kind of jumping in the middle of this, as we always are. Remember that in the original Greek text, there's no paragraph markers or even <laughs> punctuation of sentences. He's building, they're constantly building on the idea. But this verse starts for this very reason. And you're all more than intelligent enough to know that when he uses a phrase like that, based on what I just said, what has he just told us? He's told us about the great divine power of God to deliver us out of the futility of this life and our bondage to sin and into a great knowledge of the one who has called us into salvation. The one who has sacrificed his own son, who's called us out of a futile way of life into a fruitful way of life. Not just in terms of these days and this life on this earth, but looking forward into eternity as well. In other words, he wants us to say, like the Bible consistently, God doesn't leave us alone to grow. He even is present, and it is his power that is the foundation for us to grow. The indwelling gift of the Spirit in our lives is active in our desire to grow. Do we grow perfectly? Do we grow to a preset schedule that everybody, we can go down a checklist? No, it's not quite that simple. It's not quite that neat and clean cut. But he wants us to first understand that God has not called us to do something merely on our own power, 
our own volition, our own ability. But that same spirit that woke us up to the truth of Christ now will help carry us to the end and give us the power to continue to make these changes more and more on our lives. Verse 3, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, the second thing I want to point out is the nature of what we are commanded to add to our faith. Yeah, add to our faith. Now, this, the ESV chooses supplement, a perfect word to translate the Greek word. But what is it to supplement something? Some of you may have supplemental health insurance. What does that mean? It means coverage that is added to the base coverage. It is something that is sup- to supplement something is to add to it. So what is he calling us to add to? Notice that he does not give us a list of rules. He doesn't give us a list of rules. There are traditions, and I grew up one, that whether they intended to or not, all well-meaning people who I'm sure are Christians, I'm not doubting that for a second. But growing up, I got the entire idea that the heart of the Christian life, the fullest expression of the Christian life, is what you don't do. You don't go to movies. You don't play cards. You don't dance. You don't... Now, I'm not picking on anybody. Let me be very clear. I'm not picking on anybody. There may be, in particular circumstances and for particular people, extremely good reasons to avoid any and all of those things. But the irony is that it misses the point of what the Bible is actually talking about in terms of actual Christian growth. In terms of actual Christian growth, he calls us into developing character traits into our lives. How much easier, how much easier is it to avoid movies or card playing, or lipstick, or whatever the thing is. How much easier is it to do that rather than to actually add these character traits like kindness and self-control and knowledge and steadfastness? Do Do you see my point? I hope you do. The rules may be helpful and they may be appropriate in particular things, but how much easier is it to actually just have a a neat, compact checklist? You could actually observe all those things and never actually grow in any of these character traits. You could never actually become more Christ-like. What he calls us here is more difficult, more thoughtful, more purposeful and far more effective in that in terms of how God will use us according to his great plans it's quite a list isn't it quite a list let me run through it very quickly because I I'm limited in my time this morning For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. Now, this is not an order that with these things. He's not listing an order that these things will develop. He's covering the grounds. And you know what's interesting? There's two things. First of all, none of these character traits are inherently Christian. You'll find lots of people from other faith things that would agree that all these things are important disciplines of life to develop in. But you see, when the Bible talks about these characteristics, 
Who's, who's being modeled to us? Just knowledge in general? Virtue in general? No. Christ-like virtue. Christ-like knowledge. Christ-like godliness. Christ-like self-control. You see my point? We have the Apostle Peter once again saying, look, if you want to know what these things fully look like, all you got to do is look at Jesus. All you got to do is look at his life, who modeled all of them perfectly because he was the perfect expression of all of them. Now, I'm, we're limited in our time this morning because we get to celebrate the, the table together this morning. So I only have time to highlight two. Highlight two. By the way, this list sounds very familiar to the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? James has a list. There's other lists at other times. And I just want to look at two very quickly. Knowledge. Growing in knowledge is key because you can become a Christian with a very base knowledge. Absolutely. But without continuing to build that knowledge, you will be ignorant of the nuances of the faith that open up wonderful worlds about the depth and the breadth. I go back to my Sunday school, deep and wide, deep and wide. Okay. The whole nature, the vast nature of the extent of God's love for us and how much he's got in store for those who love him. How he includes all of us in his plan to bring the gospel and the truth to all the elect from every nation, tribe, and tongue. He's going to use his people as the primary means to do that, based in the truth of his word. So knowledge of God and knowledge of his word are absolutely essential if we're going to be fruitful as his followers. In fact, it's part of what you're doing here this morning, part of why you attend Bible studies. We all study God's word so that we may know the truth about him more fully. And you know what's funny? I, 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 this, this may surprise you, but I've been studying God's word for a long time. It doesn't always sound like it, I know. The more that I have studied his word over these years, the more amazing his love is. The more amazing his faithfulness is. The more amazing his power to overcome human frailty and failure and doubt and fear. His grace becomes more and more amazing with every passing year. And I trust it's similar for you. You don't have the same call that I do, very specific call within his church, but we all have the call to be believers. And I imagine that that statement that I just made is a statement that most, if not all of you, would say amen and amen to. And then let's talk about steadfastness briefly. You're committed. What is steadfastness? I had a guy one time tell me it's the ability to hang in there no matter what. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Hang in there no matter what. Whether the circumstances are exactly like you want them or the opposite of what you wish they were. Steadfastness. Committed to long-term growth of the Christian life where moral failure or any type of failure, doubts and fears do not show an end to growth, but merely a new opportunity to grow. 
I ran cross country for three years in high school. And the friend that talked me into all three of those years, I will never forgive him for that. His name was Mike Cox. We have one here with us, but this different Mike Cox. He was my buddy. And, uh, well, I didn't hate it as much as I, well, yeah, I, I actually did. Never mind. Um, here's what I found a couple things very quickly about running cross country. Three-mile races. Three-mile races. And here's what I found out. I was a much better sprinter. I wasn't a world-class sprinter, but I was far better at sprinting. 40 yards, 50 yards, 100 yards, that was my cup of tea. You start talking about mile one, mile two, mile three. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And you know what I noticed when I look back at all that time? When I lagged too far behind everybody else, the temptations to quit grew exponentially. When I got separated from everybody else in the pack for mostly and found myself way behind all by myself, the temptations of doubts and fears grew exponentially. It's kind of like that with the Christian life, isn't it? When you're not fellowshipping with the body, when you're cut off, when you've just decided I don't need to grow, I love Jesus and that's all there is to it. We'll talk about that in just a moment. The ability to, for the enemy to assault us with lies becomes more and more effective because we have very few tools to use back against him. And he wants us to know that if we fail to grow in these things, we become spiritually blind. He says it's almost like we become Mr. Magoo, who can't see without his glasses his hand in front of his face. It's like we've forgotten what God has done for us. It's like we don't understand that God's forgiveness changes everything. Changes everything. Our standing with him by his grace changes everything. And so he calls in this last section that I want to touch on very briefly, a verse that has thrown a lot of people for a loop over the years. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent. Make every effort. Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Some people have taken this verse as, see, nothing set until we set it. Make every effort be even more diligent than making every effort to make your calling and election in Christ sure. Now we have to first think about what that statement says to Who needs to be sure? There are those that want to argue that we need to make it sure to God. I can't sign off on that for a moment. You're trying to tell me that I need to do something to help God understand? That's a pretty small God you've got there. He's not sure of anything until I inform him, until I do something to convince him. That's a pretty small God. That sounds more like a Marvel superhero than a true God. No, it's about us, not God. Make it sure to us. There are people who frequently over the years have come and talked about a worry, a very profound worry, a worry that they're not actually saved. I relate to that because I've had a couple instances of my own worry. And you know what I find out every time when that worry really creeps in and becomes the big elephant in the room? because I'm looking and considering all the wrong things. I'm looking too much to myself. I'm looking not into the word of God, but in the word of this mind that at times is all fouled up. And because I can say that about myself, I can say it about you. Because this is the pot calling the kettle black. 
no, you see, he wants us to grow, not in order to gain salvation, but because we are saved. And a failure to grow often results in a lack of assurance that you belong to God. I remember, I remember lots of calls to come to Jesus, wonderful calls, and I remember a hymn being played very frequently during those times. Just as I am, without one plea, and I love the fact that God calls us to faith just as we are. But brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. He does not call us to come to Christ and remain just as we are. He calls us to be conformed to the image of Christ by the renewing of our minds. He calls us to fervently and lovely participate in the Christian life that he's called us into. Because there's this balance. And when people try to come up in a formulaic way of how much does God do and how much do I have to do, it always goes way off the rails. We must rest with the fact that the Bible clearly tells us that he has done it all and yet we are called to participate. That is a tension there that I cannot and do not want to resolve for you. It is one of the grand mysteries of our God. He calls us to actively, fervently, make every effort to continue to grow. Now, I, I want to close very quickly with this because I think it's very, very important. Um, a professor of mine has group, created four groups of people that exist in this world when it comes to salvation and assurance of salvation, being sure. And I've written them down because if I did it from memory, I think I'd screw it up. So listen with me. There are those who are not saved and are sure they are not saved. Okay? They're not saved and they'll be the first one to tell you, no, I'm not saved. In fact, the majority of those people would say, I think it's a bunch of nonsense to even talk about being saved. After all, there is no God. There's no really, it's all the same. Idea. They don't even care about it. Okay? All right. So there are those who are not saved and are sure they're not saved. Then there's a second group who, those who are saved and are sure they are saved. What a wonderful, that, that's not arrogant. If you ask me, Mike, are you sure that you're saved? I'd tell you absolutely I am. And all the reasons that I would give you have almost nothing to do with me. God's work in my life. Christ's work on my behalf. Christ continuing to grow me. All those would come into play. Third group. This is where it starts to get a little... Mm, those who are saved and are not sure if they're saved. We talked about them a little bit ago. They, they're saved, but they lack, they failed to grow, they failed to learn, they failed to, and so they, they just, they're not sure. They're just not sure. Maybe they've been cut off from the race and they're starting to feel like quitting. And then there are those who are sure that they are saved, but they're not saved. They're sure that they're saved. They've bought into a false gospel, a false Jesus. They're sure that they're saved, but they're not. And you go, well, that sounds really brutal, Pastor Mike. How could you say something like that? Because of the way, one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons, do you remember our journey through the Sermon on the Mount? Do you remember the last section of the Sermon on the Mount? Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not in your name do such and such? And I will say to them, away from me, I never knew you. Oh, well, pastor, how can I know that I'm not one of those? Hold on a moment. Hold on a moment. You see, part of it is, do you embrace the current thinking that leads to 
those conclusions. The current thinking about we believe in justification by faith alone. I'm justified because I trust in Christ and what he has done for me. It's a faith. Not that I've done anything, but Christ has done it on my behalf. The current thinking seems to be justification by death. You just die and you automatically go to heaven. You hear it all the time. Well, they're in a better place. The current thinking seems to be largely justification by death. All dogs go to heaven. You're dead, therefore you're in heaven. Or, the other possibility is, and, and perhaps I don't know what the percentage is of it, it's most common, justification by overall goodness. I'm a good person. In fact, I can list for you I, I don't actually keep track, but I can list for you a dozen names right off the top of my head that I'm better than. I'm a good person. You don't see me on the news. I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't stolen anything of big value. I've never cheated the government out of a lot of money in my taxes. I may have thought about committing adultery, but I've not actually done it. And on and on. Justification by overall goodness. Here's the problem. And you guys have heard me say it before. You're going to hear me say it again. You're using the wrong standard. Every one of those people is using the wrong standard. You are not be judged about your goodness in comparison to your neighbor or Hitler or anybody else. Every person will be judged in their overall good enough to be in heaven by the standard of Jesus Christ and his life. The true Adam. The true image bearer of God. And three or four people right now are thinking, Pastor, that is not fair. Nobody can do that. Aha! Enter the gospel. Enter the gospel to trust in his life and not on my own. You see, the certainty of faith comes not even from our growth. That's a byproduct of it. It comes from a certain trust in Christ. His life, his death, his resurrection, his life. It's a justification, not of works, not of our works, it's a justification of faith in his works. Our faith in his works. And that's what this table represents. This table is a celebration of all who love Jesus, the biblical Jesus, not the made-up Jesus of the false teachers who never has anything controversial to say. Remember I asked, well, how do I know I'm not one of those? Let me ask you a question. Do you love Jesus? Well, I don't love him perfectly. That's not what I asked. Do you love him? And do you love the biblical Jesus, not the one you've made up in your head? In other words, do you love the Jesus that has the audacity to say things you don't want him to say, and yet you still love him? That's what this table is for. For those who still have their fears and doubts and difficulties, and gather at the table to cling to him by faith. I'm sorry, we're going to go over time a little bit. It's okay, relax, I'm a professional, we can do this. This table is for all who cling to him by faith and love a savior, a perfect savior, one who led a perfect life and died a death on my behalf and on yours. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you so much for your word to us today. And Father, we ask that you continue to bless us now as we not only hear the word and feast on what we've heard, but feast on the word presented visually to us. For all of us who cling to you by faith, Father, be with us now as we celebrate this sacrament together, this sign of your covenant with us. May you be praised forever and ever. In Christ's name, amen. If you would please stand and join me in singing our final hymn, number 433.
And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with and among you, both now and forever. Go from this place and love one another, even as God in Christ has loved you. Amen.